I fear I don't have much to say. Uh, at least um, we have to come down now a little bit. We come to the end of the symposium, so I think we really let it go, and I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information. So my topic is only transcatheter atrial pulmonary shunt. Uh, and this starts... Pardon? No, this is not published in Bill Zeitung. <laughs> this is another story. Um, so this is an old story. Um, this is, uh, you see how old it is, it doesn't work any longer. Uh, but this is an autopulmonary shunt in a pig, um, here with the stent between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And uh, this was done by, um, by catheterization. And yesterday during the quiz, um, Stanislav was so, so kind and said, we have been the first who established this. This is not quite right. In Berlin, it was, yeah, okay. We have been the first in wedding, actually. And <laughs> but um, a few years before, in Amsterdam at the AEPC, there have been a working group from Russia, um, and they did something similar um, in two dogs and they published it several years later, but they had a relatively compli complex um, um, technique. They used magnetic catheters, which then attached on both sides of the vessel, and then they could go through with special devices, and they invented a special self-expanding stent to establish this. So we did it another way. We just took uh, piglets, and um, we had, in 2009, this uh, talk by Titus Zabi, and uh, as you can see, um, the talk was in October 2009, so the, the experiments have been done before, so that we can roughly say 10 years are gone th since then. So, and because 10 years is a long time, I just want to show you a few of those slides. So, these are the, uh, this is the heart of the team um, who did this. Uh, terrific work, I, uh, well, it was my idea, but these were my hands, and they did excellent work, I have to say. And uh, the idea was clear, we thought pulmonary artery and aorta are um, close together, so why not go there and puncture it? And we used only materials which have been available on the market, and this was mainly the radio frequency perforator, uh, the Bayless um, radio frequency perforator. And, uh, we did a simultaneous angiography in the pulmonary artery and in the, in the aorta, and uh, after that, there was this perforation uh, with this, uh, with a cutted pigtail catheter as a guiding cath, and then we could um, advance a wire into the pulmonary artery coming from the aorta, and uh, in the end, it was we were able to um, to implant the stent there. And you see it's so old, they don't find anything. But it was relatively straightforward. So I dare to say it was relatively easy because we did it the first for the first time and it worked. And in the end, we got this result with a stent between these two large vessels. And this was about 10 years ago. So if you remember what we learned yesterday about blalock tausig and the invention of the BT shunt, and after a few years, I think it were three, after three years, they had performed 600 procedures. Uh, now we have 10 years after this tremendous idea that we do it by CAF. So if you extrapolate this, you could say, well, PubMed must be full of reports about this uh, genius technique. Um, well, so with this purpose, I looked through it. Uh, well, this is the stand between the large um, vessels. On the right side is the, uh, the uh, um, aorta on the left side is the pulmonary artery, and uh, the stent sticks out. It was a covered stent in this case, and uh, yeah, well, these were the pictures. And uh, therefore, the question: Is it a routine procedure? Where are the thousands of interventions with this technique? And uh, before we answer this burning questions, we want to ask: Why does it work anyhow? Because when um, Forsman put in his first catheter by himself to the heart. Everybody thought, oh, he is crazy. Uh, in the meantime, it is million and million done, million times done, and everybody said, so what? 
Um, why does it work anyhow? Why doesn't it bleed? Why, why, why does it work? And uh, it's relatively simple. Whenever you put in a sheath, a central venous line, or a radial artery in a body, it doesn't bleed either. So as, soon, as long as you put something into a vessel which is larger than the puncture site, then you just bring the tissue out of the way and the tissue will seal the thing whatever you do it, uh, you ever um, introduce there. But you know when you try to size it down, then it might bleed. So as long as you size up and putting in a stent somewhere and uh, blowing it up means you size up uh, the, the, uh, the, the hole you created, then it is sealed by the tissue around. So this is a major principle, it's relatively trivial, why shouldn't it work inside the body? And it works even in situations like that where you have to bridge a longer part of uh, tissue and then you can size it up by a covered stand and it works as well without bleeding. So sizing up is the, 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 the fundamental method behind it. So now clinically relevant, let's have a look at PubMed. And to be honest, there are practically no real large series and reported reports who, um, about this technique. Uh, what you could find is more or less these two publications, and this is about the reverse POTS shunt, um, what Dittmar already mentioned, and showed us one case. I will not show you any case because I didn't perform them, but these are the group in Boston from Landsberg and Bujamin from France. And if you look at the numbers, then you see the Boston group treated five and were successful in three and the Paris group treated six and report four successful cases. So the indication for reverse pot shunt, and this is perhaps not that astonishing, is, um, well, these are not so much patients. Nevertheless, I think the, there could be more patients once the method is more established because I think it's a very elegant way uh, to give uh, the possibility for decompressing the pulmonary arteries. However, of course, it competes with uh, a duct stenting whenever there is one. So you see the relevance of this seems to be very low. But what is with all these kids, I already told to you, who have the need, for example, for a BT shunt? Why couldn't they get this transcatheter shunt? The classical indication, let's say. Well, most shunts today were performed in the hypoplastic left heart syndrome portion with a, Nor a Norwood procedure. And there, well, we have, if we don't have the, the there, well, we have the surgical approach or the um, hybrid approach. The hybrid approach is ductal stenting. And all the other ones um, where you have the chance to get a newborn which uh, needs to be more blood flow to the lungs, then of course you have the duct available. So stenting the duct is probably much easier than creating a shunt. And then, of course, there are some uh, with, under, um, with uh, less supply to the lungs of blood where the RVOT perforation is a very good alternative as well. So, in fact, to create a shunt is relatively rare nowadays. And if so, then in the, main, in the majority of these rare patients, it is combined with uh, surgical procedures which we can't do uh, by catheter means. However, um, the technical aspects, and I, I, I would like to emphasize this, is that we just look what we have in our lab to create a new method. And this is perhaps one of the things I would like to emphasize in this connection. Um, look what you have, look what we have available. Even if we don't have it in our lab, there are so many medical products on the market and especially for other indications which might be helpful for uh, transcatheter techniques um, in another context. So, and furthermore, if we look at this result of our shunt, then we have to admit this is perhaps not the best solution. We just put in a stent and the stent sticks out to both sides. We, of course, could think of a more smoother solution where we perhaps have something like a metal device which uh, really sticks to, 
to the vessel walls without sticking out. So there could be a lot of fantasy to engineering techniques and to devices which might be better than just putting in a stand. So the optimal device could be designed, of course. However, there we have some obstacles, and the obstacle is the congenu it's, it's a congenual simple technique, but it's for a very limited patient group, and we have no market for the industry, as always, and no chance at the moment to pass European regulatories. Whoever wanted to invent a device for such an exotic indication. And this is uh, almost the end, but because this is a, the last talk of this symposium, I would not just stop with such a perhaps disappointing end. I would emphasize that this technique works and uh, whenever you have a problem with a patient where you think it's a good solution, then just call us. We would be happy to introduce it because we think uh, it's a very good one. And I would like to to make a more overall comment, the idea is what we should do in pediatric cardiology, because we don't have the, the medical and economic power, because we don't have uh, the possibilities in Europe at the moment with the regulatory uh, problems we have, just dream your dream what you want to, li what you want to achieve. And I mean this as I thought, I thought it, because I think pediatric cardiologists have to be dreamers in some way. Dream that dream and then think it over how you could realize it. Look for cooperation, for cooperating partners. Look for what is on the market in the neuroradiologist field, in the cardiology field, and then consider what you can make out of it and then just do it. And I think this should be the aim for new procedures on the long run. Thank you. Mm -hmm.